Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Leveraging Partnerships in Planning or Hosting a Communities Talk webinar. Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the webinar over to our moderator, Marion Pierce from SAMHSA. Please go ahead, Marion. Welcome, everyone. I'm Marion Pierce, a public health analyst at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, or CSAP. I am the coordinator of SAMHSA's Communities Talk Town Hall Meetings Initiatives, and I will serve as the moderator for today's webinar. Our discussion will focus on best practices for engaging partners in a Communities Talk Town Hall Meeting to prevent underage drinking event and how to achieve positive outcomes based on partnerships. Presenters on today's panel will discuss strategies they've used to create and maintain strong partnerships that have helped them achieve their underage and high-risk drinking prevention goals. Before we begin, I would like to make a couple of housekeeping announcements. First, please use the chat pod to send us your thoughts and questions throughout each speaker's presentation. There will be a question and answer period following all of the speaker presentations, and I will share your questions with our panel at that time. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on SAMHSA's YouTube page. So if you have colleagues or coalition partner who wasn't able to join us, they can access the webinar on demand. Also, we will make a PDF of the slide presentation available after the webinar so you'll have the information and resources that we discuss today at your fingertips. You can share the data, resources, and strategies we discuss with your colleagues and partners. So let me give you a brief introduction on the Communities Talk Initiative. Since 2006, when the initiative began, more than 10,000 SAMHSA-sponsored meetings have been conducted every two years by community-based organizations as well as colleges and universities nationwide. Community talk events educate the community about consequences of underage drinking and mobilize communities to use evidence-based approaches, including environmental protection, to reduce underage drinking. Now, while, some, while these events focus on underage alcohol use, other topics such as opioids and marijuana can be included in the conversation. Communities Talks events work. Results show that events mobilize community members to take action based on newly acquired knowledge. From the feedback that we received from the 2016 participant survey, we saw that 94% committed to sharing information with others, 84% reported that they gained new knowledge, and 25% planned to begin participating in an underage drinking prevention action group. As you'll learn from today's speakers, Communities Talks events can help you develop partners and sponsors to develop additional support for your overall underage drinking pre prevention efforts. Partners increase your organization's capacity by supplying volunteers, promoting events to their audience through organizational websites and other communication platforms, including social media, furnishing meeting space, refreshments, and or office supplies, and providing financial support. On this slide are examples of partners that have participated in Communities Talks events. We will have a question and answer period after the presentations. Please feel free to use the chat box for any questions you have during the webinar. So let's kick off today's presentation. Our first speaker is Allison Marks. Allison is a 17-year-old senior at Placer County, uh, pardon me, at Placer High School and a Placer County Youth Commissioner. She is on the leadership board of the commission as the multimedia producer and the co-chair of the prevention subcommittee. Please join us in welcoming Allison. Hi, thank you, Marion. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about our methods when it comes to leveraging partnerships and planning for prevention. Um, so first I'm going to briefly discuss who we partner with for success. 
So who we partner with for success all is underneath what we call RaisingPlaster.org, which is pretty much all the prevention coalitions within our county working together under a common goal to help protect our youth from using different substances. Um, under that umbrella, we work with different co drug-free coalitions, such as the Coalition for Auburn and Lincoln Youth, the Coalition for Placer Youth, and ourselves, obviously, the Placer County Youth Commission. Um, another important group of people we love to work with is our local law enforcement. Our local law enforcement is an important collaborator, as they're the ones who are often going to be implementing and enforcing the different legislature we pass to protect our youth, and their support is a key component to getting any of our things passed, such as the social host ordinances within our uh, county. Um, if they support our social host ordinance or any other sort of legislature that needs to be passed, is more likely to be passed by different um, local governments, um, who is another partner we also work with. Um, so some of the local governments we work with are our uh, Placer County Board of Supervisor, Supervisors. Um, they were a key component to getting our social host ordinance passed throughout the entire Placer County. But we also work with smaller local governments, such as the city councils and their staff, to get um, different things passed and implemented within different towns or cities and different places like that, not just over the overarching county. Um, so next I'm going to be talking about how we work with these different groups um, through our collaborative projects. So we all come together to work on different projects that impact the youth in several ways and everybody else throughout the community. Um, so one of our biggest projects that we've been successful on and have worked on for many years now is passing different social host ordinances throughout our county and in different towns within our county. Um, the social host ordinance uh, often is misconceived as just for alcohol, but it also includes all of the different substances, including marijuana and alcohol. Um, and then we also work on a bunch of informative projects, such as we do a sticker shop shown on the left where the sticker that says warning. Um, for this, we went and went to our local convenience stores and just informed adults that buying alcohol for minors and then redistributing outside of the convenience store is still illegal. And then we put on different other informative events, such as a community forum right there or a town hall meeting. Um, this is kind of our little community outreach project, um, our community talk event. And this allows parents and law enforcement and everybody else to ask questions and it involves the community directly. Um, so this allows us to partner with several people within the community, not just law enforcement or local government or other drug-free coalitions. It allows us to also work with parents and youth to um, create new ideas and improve upon our prevention methods. We also do different informative events for just the youth. Um, and this involves everybody. This involves law enforcement, different outside speakers, faith-based organizations, and educators. So on our left here, we have a summer leadership retreat where we brought in a bunch of outside speakers to just educate the youth on how different substances can affect them as they grow, whether it's psychologically, uh, physically, and even legally with bringing up sh the social host ordinance to them. And so on the right, we had another project where we went to our local high school. Uh, it was a drug-free coalition and law enforcement collaborative project. And as you can see, the kids here are having a blast driving go-karts, but what they're wearing are um, goggles that show how it is to drive impaired. Um, this is, was a fun chance but all, to drive go-karts, but also teaches them the dangers of impaired driving and, different, and it allowed us to educate them on different effects of sub, using substances. Um, this was also another great chance for um, several partners to come together, whether or not they could be there, because uh, we had several groups like the Coalition for Auburn Lincoln Youth, Coalition for Placer Youth, different law enforcement agencies, and the Placer County Youth Commission. We all came together and chipped in some money to purchase these go-karts and purchase the goggles, which allowed us to put on this informative event. So that was another great way to include more partnerships within the community um, by simply 
just donating and contributing some financial aid to purchasing these different go-karts and materials. Um, another way we are able to collaborate with different um, groups within our community are by going to different summits and educational opportunities. Uh, this allows us to educate or stay educated on different topics and new research um, data and different things like that, and new prevention efforts by collaborating with people across the country, such as when we attended uh, CADCA, which is shown in the left photo. And here is a photo of uh, different commissioners from the Posse County Youth Commissioners, uh, different people from other drug-free coalitions. We have some people from our faith-based organizations and our educators within this photo, and including um, uh, Congressman Tom McClintock, who represents our congressional district. And it um, is just a bunch of placer uh, citizens all working together to help protect our youth. And on these trips, we were able to collaborate with different people from other states to see how we can better um, and improve our prevention efforts. And on the right, we have a bunch of young commissioners visiting or attending the Office of Traffic Safety Summit to learn more and learn from other people within the state and how they're doing their own prevention projects. Okay, so some of the results we see from these different collaborative um, partnerships and efforts are we always get to educate the public and the youth through our project. Um, so educating our youth is a huge critical component as they can hopefully spread the information to their friends, their parents, and even grandparents, and so on, teachers, et cetera, just causing a snowball effect and spreading the information and prevention efforts throughout your entire community. We also get to empower new leaders. So we get through these projects that involve the youth, we get to empower the leaders of tomorrow. And those leaders hopefully will take our message to heart and work to prevent the next generation from using any illegal substances and so on. And they'll, and that next generation will do the same for the next generation and so on and so on. Another result we get to uh, see is sometimes we get to see legislature pass, such as when we pass social host ordinances. So this is a critical um, part of our prevention plan as it actually is it makes it illegal for parents and other family members to host underage substance abuse within their own property. Um, and this also creates new projects for us while preventing those problems. This allows us to re-educate parents and re-educate law enforcement and educators and youth and so on and opens up a bunch of new opportunities for us to keep educating the public. Um, another result we get to see is data. Data is super crucial for getting um, financial aid and funding for our coalition. So as we see here from 2013 to 2018 within Placer County, there was a massive drop in alcohol usage among 11th grade students and a massive drop in cannabis, prescription drugs, binge drinking, and nicotine. Although now as nicotine, as you can see, it wasn't as great of a drop, it opened up a new project for us to fight against e-cigarettes and other things and hopefully in the near future, we'll have a larger decrease in that. Um, so these are just some of the results that can come from different partnerships um, in prevention. And um, that's all I have for you guys today. And we have more information on our different websites, such as raisingclasses.org and Placid Youth. Cool. Great. Thank you, Allison, for sharing the remarkable results of the Youth Commission's efforts. As a reminder, you can use the chat box for any questions you have during the webinar. Now I'd like to shift the focus to Dr. Sally Lenowski. Dr. Lenowski is the Associate Dean of Students for Off-Campus Student Life and Community Engagement at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She creates opportunities for community outreach fosters student engagement in the community, and maintains relationships with town officials, landlords, residents, and university staff. Dr. Lenowski established the Campus and Community Coalition to reduce high-risk drinking and founded the University Center 
for Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Prevention. Welcome, Dr. Lenowski. Thank you, Marion. Um, I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about how to engage um, campus and community partners in planning and executing your town hall meeting. Next slide, please. These images are um, some of uh, me and my work in a naturalistic setting. And the reason I like them is that they show the power of partnership. Whether you're participating in a downtown block party, inviting community residents to join your students on campus to learn about mutual areas of concern related to underage and problematic drinking, or networking with colleagues at an international town gown association. What I'll talk with you about today is our campus and community coalition's role in organizing a community talk town hall meeting in October 2016. Next slide, please. Our community's talk event was sponsored by our campus and community coalition, which is a prevention coalition established in 2004 that uses evidence-based prevention strategies to reduce alcohol-related harm among college students and youth in our community. We have taken a public health approach that engages diverse stakeholders to address the complex social and environmental challenges that contribute to dangerous drinking practices. Next slide, please. Partnerships are essential for achieving what researchers refer to as collective impact for social change. A prevention coalition is a social change agent when it effectively manages these and other five factors having a common agenda, tracking progress and aiming for continuous improvement, coordinating efforts, building trust among participants, and having a clear organization structure that orchestrates the work and builds sustainability. It's important to note that a town hall meeting can be a one-off event, meaning a way to identify issues or work towards building partnerships. But in our case, because our coalition has credibility and proven success, and is seen as a positive and solution-oriented group, we were able to broach a potentially controversial topic in a creative and visible way. We were able to bring diverse groups of stakeholders together to talk about, in essence, how to reduce underage and heavy drinking and its effects in a college town while being business friendly and inviting all ages to downtown for fun social activities that don't necessarily revolve around drinking or adding more bars to the community. Next slide, please. Our town hall was held in October 2016, and it was really a way to identify community assets and envision new ideas on how to achieve a safe and vibrant nightlife in the Amherst area. The town was interested in stimulating the local economy reinteresting people in coming downtown for arts, entertainment, and leisure, while the university and the CCC were interested in making sure underage students had alcohol-free options, retailers were responsible in alcohol sales, and the community was not ne negatively impacted by the bar and party scene. We invited the Chamber of Commerce, the Business Improvement District, bar and business owners, town government, student leaders, CCC, and university staff to help plan our town hall meeting. The discussion was a blue sky session where no idea was off the table. We wanted to allow people to dream and envision not what is or what should be, but what could be. Our coalition members used their community organizing and group facilitation skills to not only personally invite diverse stakeholders to participate, but also to guide the roundtable discussions. A local business owner with a newly opened co-working space called Amherst Works in a renovated downtown bank provided an accessible location for our town hall meeting. This gave him free advertising for his business, brought opinion leaders into the location to experience the feel and vibe of the space, who in turn might recommend it to others to rent space. It also had folks being asked to think outside the box in a space that was clearly an example of thinking outside the box. It was a new, innovative downtown business model. Next slide, please. It's important to think about how we do prevention and build coalitions. Good prevention leaders are community organizers. They get to know the culture, the people, the issues, the conflicts, 
other groups working on similar issues, and they work strategically to understand the currency of potential allies. We listen well, we take notes, we pay attention to what is being said or what is being not said. Finding out what community members value. A town hall meeting is a way to build interest, to hear stories, to gather input and build relationships. Next slide, please. Coalitions and collaboration are all about relationships. Starting a town hall meeting with an activity where folks partner with another person they don't know or know very well and say their name and what they love about their community is a great example. The next time you could add, and I care about prevention because. This allows us to identify shared values by learning each other's stories, especially choice points in our life journeys. By allowing people's time and space for sharing what we enjoy doing during our free time, people find commonalities and hear other points of view. So in organizing your town hall meeting, you're organizing relationships. And it's not simply a transactional um, business. We are looking for leaders and champions to join us in long-term relationships of learning, growth, and action to reduce AOD use among our students. So our town hall meeting was clearly a relational tactic. Being part of a national initiative gave us press coverage, visibility, and made us feel supported in our work. Your community's talk event can jumpstart your work too. Next slide. Additionally, to embed prevention into our communities, we have to shift our mindset from that of a leader to that of an organizer. Leadership from the perspective of a learner, meaning one who asks the right questions versus the knower, one who has all the answers. We approach the work with a unique, unique lens, visioning what could be as opposed to what is. Our town hall meeting was focused on an area of mutual interest, having a vibrant downtown district for all ages that would be inviting to youth, families, college students, older adults, but that would not become a bourbon street type locale with public intoxication, underage drinking, OUI, crime, public urination, and other health and public safety issues. Next slide, please. So how do you do this? Getting people to partner with our prevention initiatives requires sev several elements. I spoke about starting with the values. We value health and safety of our young people. We know you do too. We use credible messengers to spread the word. We had student government and peer leaders invite other students. The Business Improvement District invited the local business owners. A bar owner invited his fellow bar owners. And town government invited local residents. We brought tons of enthusiasm and a catchy hook. What is the role of alcohol venues in driving the local economy? Who misses out? How do we engage all citizens in bringing vitality, arts, culture, retail, food, and drink and more to one of the best college towns in America? We wanted to bring people to the table who could see things differently. This was an essential part of our planning process. These folks helped plan the event and had more buy-in because of it. We had a short panel presentation, very short, 10 minutes, featuring the director of our local business improvement district, a town government leader who is active on our CCC, the student government president, a cinema and bar owner, and a dean of students who uh, talking about why we care about this issue and why this town hall meeting was important. We then broke up into small groups to brainstorm, and boy, did the creativity flow. Next slide, please. At the end of the brainstorm, which was a sort of a two-hour inclusive experience, Groups came together to share their ideas, and later the coalition leaders compiled the notes and shared them with the participants. Here you can see the major themes that evolved. And you can also see our actionable now items. Next slide, please. In closing, here are some tips for making your town hall, meet your town hall meeting a winner. Have food. People love food. Refreshments can liven up an environment, help people feel relaxed, um, and allow more informal conversation. Have a clear purpose and plan for your meeting. Create a small working group to plan the nuts and bolts. Location matters. 
Access to parking, public transportation, walking, and a neutral location can be ideal. So maybe you find a space that doesn't, isn't on your campus or isn't at your police department, but is somewhere new and exciting and sort of neutral. Be media friendly. Having sound bites, a catchy title, inviting the media to your event, have designated spokespeople at the ready, take photos to post on your own social media, but make sure your lighting and setup is photo friendly. Report back. Our town website, our university websites all posted the final report, and we made a glossy copy for distribution that could be distributed at different venues around town and on campus to show the work. And lastly, send thank yous and celebrate your success. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Sally. Um, I would like to think of that as a checklist of a winning um, <laughs> town hall meeting, and I will keep that in mind. Also, for our attendees, please keep in mind that if you have questions, please use the chat box. For um, and if you want them to be uh, answered by a specific presenter, please let us know that. But please um, post those questions now so that we can um, uh, start answering those questions after Becky's presentation. So with that in mind, I'd like to dive into how the Center for Prevention and Counseling uh, Services uh, engages youth. As Thank you, Marion. Good afternoon, everyone. The Coalition for Healthy and Safe Communities has been a vital force for over 20 years up here in Sussex County, New Jersey, working to reduce underage drinking. It's uh, important to, to know that we began our work ten, with 10 years of drug-free community grant funding, and we've sustained our prevention work since then for an additional 10 years in a variety of ways. And one of those is with strong membership, and another one is with active participation of our dedicated coalition members. In fact, our current coalition chairperson has been a member since the coalition's inception, only missing a handful of meetings in 20 years. And another member, has been here, has been with us since she was 16 years old, where she started as one of our youth group members. And now Ayla has stayed active with us where she went to college, she then interned with us, and now she's a staff member and a mom. And she continues to do prevention work out in our community at the local community college, uh, doing a variety of programs up there. But besides strong membership, key to coalition work is really having active participation from all the sectors, meaning that your members are at the meetings, that your members are part of your planning committee, that they're at events, and that they're at programs. And that has really helped us to be at the forefront of our work up here in New Jersey, uh, proudly showing that prevention works in our county. But what I want to really share with you is some information is what's really working for us. Next slide. It, with our town hall meetings, which are very popular coalition events, and a lot of that is really due to youth and youth involvement in the planning and, and the participation at the event. In fact, since 2006, we've been hosting these type of town hall meetings with youth being involved and in helping to lead the event. And they're always held in April, which for us um, is important because it's Alcohol Awareness Month. But our community's talk event works because we really work to engage our various sectors and as a result, the event is really a big deal in our county. And the youth are featured, and as a result, many come to cheer them on and be part of the fun for the evening. We have parents, siblings, caregivers, and, and grandparents there to support their child. But in addition, what's really exciting to see every year is that besides that, we have those other people that are important in a child's life, such as principals and teachers, coaches, some of their scout leaders, and even police chiefs and mayors from their communities attend the event. We have state and federal legislators there to support our youth. In fact, our state senator, Steve Orho, has been a keynote speaker at every single event, and he's a proud coalition member committed to our mission. Our local chief of police, Mike Richards, is a presenter, and he makes all the arrangements for the event, which is held in our municipal courtroom. Key points we address to parents at our events are to talk early, and talk often with the understanding that prevention starts at home. Additionally, we also work to address reducing access to alcohol, which include youth-led sticker shock events, responsible beverage training, trainings for servers and retailers, and looking at local ordinances. Next slide. 
I would imagine other coalitions would agree it can be a difficult to engage the community to attend events and meetings. But our important secret ingredient to our uh, community's talk town hall meetings is the involvement of our youth. We give our local youth a voice and we recognize our talented and community-minded young people. So the exciting part of the night is that during our town hall meeting, we have a short interactive presentation about underage drinking called Straight Talk. We use a quiz show format where the attendees use clickers to answer the questions in real time and they can see the audience's responses. The youth coalition members do this fun presentation and get attendees to play the game in a competitive nature which really engages everyone no matter what age they are. And they allow for Q&A time and many times the adults are surprised when they find out some of the facts about underage drinking that the youth share with them. Next slide. Another way we engage our community in our alcohol awareness um, event is with the use of a, a contest where we have children from uh, grades 4 to 12 enter a contest for uh, underage drinking contest for the month with posters, essays, and videos that can be submitted. And the winners are then featured in local newspaper, on local radio, on websites, and around the county at local events, our town halls, and at our police departments. The schools are really encouraged to get their students involved with the idea that you've got to play to win to have their students featured in this exciting contest. And we have schools that send in many, many uh, entries every year are excited about seeing if they can have their school win again with one of their students. Next slide. We utilize fun different themes every year, whether it be elect to be free, alcohol free during election time, or life is your journey, travel alcohol free, or start talking before they start drinking. With the hundreds of entries that we get, our coalition members serve as judges to pick the winners. Then at the town hall meeting, the winners and their families are invited along with all the other supporting adults in that child's life where they're honored for their work. Our senator is proud to be there and he presents citations and a small gift to, the, to each of the winners. And it really doesn't get old seeing the proud parents and grandparents taking photos of their children with all the different speakers at the end of the evening because they're so proud of their children. Next slide. Our local radio station allows the winners to come in and record their PSAs, which you can see from the slide, the kids are very excited to be a part of that. All of these PSAs are played out throughout all of our different radio stations throughout the county during April's Alcohol Awareness Month. And again, the day of the, tape, the taping is really exciting, not only for their youth, the youth that participate, but the families, because they're so honored and thrilled to be recording their own messages that are going to be played live on the radio for each of them to hear uh, in their community. Next slide. Communities Talk is all about community engagement. And anytime we can get youth to attend our coalition meetings, that's where you see the magic of youth involvement. Their ideas, their messages, their input, it's all inspiring and it really helps to motivate the adults in our coalition. I know we all heard Allison earlier that it was exciting to hear the different things she was doing in her community. Sometimes in order to get youth involved, it means adjusting a meeting to take place after school, at the school, or in the evenings, but it is really worth the effort. And having fun refreshments like tacos in a bag or ice cream sundaes can add to the fun when you have youth involved. And lastly, by allowing youth to have a voice and letting them take a lead, it will allow you to each see the magic happen in your community. Next slide. An important lesson I learned early in my prevention work was don't reinvent the wheel. There are so many resources out there for all of our coalitions and prevention organizations to utilize. First, there's SAMHSA and its many incredible initiatives with a variety of tools that are so well thought out and easy to utilize, such as Talk They Hear You, Communities Talk, National Drug Fact Week, National Prevention Week. All of these initiatives feature underage drinking resources and tools and make it so easy to utilize and personalize in your community. And there's other great resources too. Parents Who Host Lose the Most is a popular one out of the Prevention Action Alliance in Ohio and has many great tools that you can utilize and personalize. Parents Empowered is a campaign out of Utah that's statewide that has incredibly um, engaging uh, ideas that people can utilize. And I know for me over the years, Sharing with other coalitions is, is so important. Everybody is really always happy to share with you, as you know, we are to share with them. It's really just a matter of finding the coalition and asking them. And it's important when you do that to personalize the message to fit your needs in your community, because we're each different. 
also, we all know that utilizing social media to spread your message and help engage your community is really key. Next slide. I encourage you to check out our web website and our Facebook to see more about what we're doing with underage uh, drinking prevention. And as I said before, outreach around the country and find out what other coalitions and other organizations are doing because there's so many new ideas and strategies that you can find to fit your prevention needs. And as I've been telling you throughout my, my part of this presentation, engaging, engaging youth to use their passion, their creativity, to spread your prevention, prevention message for further and greater impact will really help your prevention work down the line. And I want to say we truly thank SAMHSA for providing the stipends that they've been doing. It's helped our coalition present great town hall meetings where we've been working to address underage drinking. This national movement is really helping to move the needle across the country in reducing youth use of alcohol. Best wishes to everyone for a successful and engaging Communities Talk town hall meeting. Thank you. And thank you, Becky, for sharing those valuable insights. I'm sure other communities will be hosting their meetings in April during Alcohol Awareness Month, and it will be interesting to hear how the commission coordinated their Communities Talk Town Hall meeting with, their national, with that national observance. Now we will have a time for a few questions from the audience. As we mentioned before, please use the chat feature to share your questions with us. I will start off with um, a question for, uh, hopefully all of the panelists can respond to this. And it's basically, what strategies have you found most effective when starting the initial process of recruiting partners? So how do you select and select, engage, and retain your partners? Hi. Throw it to you. Hi, this is Becky. I think it's really important to, you know, outreach to all the different sectors and ask people. You know, many times people don't get involved because they, they don't know what's going on or they don't know that you have a coalition that's out there. So really working within, for example, we've really done a lot of work outreaching to clergy and we work strongly, as Allison in, uh, indicated, with our law enforcement. So it's really reaching out into your community and assessing who's out there and working to build that capacity uh, to get people involved. Hi, this is Sally. I would, I would agree with Becky um, in that thinking about different people who would be interested in partnering, partnering and also having your coalition members um, they'll be in touch with other people or other initiatives. Usually they're pretty engaged in their communities. Have them think about who they might invite to, to attend. And I think in terms of retaining members, sometimes you know, we can struggle to retain members when really their time is done. Either their job has changed, their interest has changed, or um, they're just not as engaged in the coalition. And, and I think in addition to trying to retain our members, sometimes it's giving them permission um, to step back for, and, and to turn the, the table over to someone else who maybe has some new energy, because I think that's um, often important as well, is to allow people um, to leave the coalition. Maybe they'll come back at some point, or maybe they'll get involved in a different way. This is Becky. Another idea too, I think it's important to remember, not everybody can make meetings. Somebody, sometimes I think we judge our, our you know, popularity mm -hmm. with the coalition by who comes, how many people are coming to a meeting. But not everybody can attend, so I think it's important to make sure whether, however you communicate through Instagram or, or texting or email, however it is that you communicate with your coalition members to keep them abreast of what's going on. Because sometimes they can't come to the meeting, but yet they'll help you find a location or they'll you know, connect you with the school. You know, there's so many different things that people can do out in the community uh, that you know, it doesn't necessarily mean if they don't come to the meeting that they're not active and they can't participate. Um, hi. So one of our ways we really um, get a lot of people to attend is we do a huge recruitment uh, effort at, before the end of each school year to try to recruit a new generation of youth. Um, and how we retain our high membership um, rates is we constantly are having events for them to uh, attend. So uh, every term we have around two to three events, and we have meetings at least twice a month so it really engages the youth who participate within our program. 
We also do a huge outreach through social media. Um, as I'm the multi multimedia producer for our Youth Commission, um, I'm constantly just putting in the effort to make sure I reach enough of the youth within our county. Great. Thanks all. Next question. So what strategies were implemented to create sustainable win-win opportunities for all of your stakeholders? I think it's important to know, this is Becky, to know um, what your different stakeholders' interests are and why they're there at the table. So if it's a business owner, you know, they might be there because they, they care about kids, they care about their community, but they also have a business. So if you can get them involved, uh, we have a, 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 a local business that's uh, very big in the community. It's a ski place in the winter and a, a water park in the summer. And having them at the table is important because sometimes they'll host different meetings, they'll host different events, and it gets people up to them, but it also gets our, our you know, members out to have some fun. Sometimes also leading a meeting with a, with a prompt, um, such as, you know, I, I'm so-and-so and I care about prevention because, or I'm so-and-so and I represent X agency, and a burning issue for us right now that relates to this topic is whatever that may be, so that it, it has people actually reflect on what their interests are and, and what's sort of on the front burner for them at that moment and also can be shared um, with a larger group to keep the momentum going and potentially to find um, areas of intersection. Great. Sally, I'll toss this question out to you. What has been your greatest uh, challenge or challenges to prevention? Partnership, I always think about prevention, no, to partnerships. And how have you addressed those challenges? Well, Mary, and that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think there are challenges that pop up in sometimes really direct ways in your face, and then there are challenges that are sort of longer term. I would say a pretty consistent challenge that we've had is changes in leadership. Um, and by that, I mean um, changes in police chiefs, either at the university or in the town, changes in a vice chancellor for students affairs, changes in the chancellor, changes in forms of town government. So whenever sort of that um, key leadership position or positions changes, there can be a little bit of a struggle in sort of not, not necessarily communicating what your coalition and your prevention work is about, but getting on the, that person's agenda. And making sure that in a very brief way, because their time is busy, you can let them know that this group is here, they're effective, they're supportive, and not to worry. Um, so I would say that has been, our coalition has been in place um, almost as long as Becky's, I guess, and that we've had so many changes in leadership. Um, and we've sometimes stumbled a little bit because we haven't quite known how to get the attention of that particular leader. So Becky or Allison, would you do you have anything else to add to Sally's comment? I just want to add that I think that one of the things that always helps me and helps us when we're, you know, try, we're having any struggles or or you know, we're working out in the community is one thing we always remember that our members are parents, their grandparents, their aunts, their uncles, their sisters, their brothers, their neighbors with kids, their coaches. They do so many different things in their community. And the thing that we all have, our bottom line, we all have a bottom line of healthy kids, healthy communities. You know, nobody can argue with that. And uh, by providing, you know, your members with different tools that they can utilize at their place of work, their house of worship, um, at any organization they belong to, whether it be materials, whether it be a lunch and learn that you can help them turn key that they could do out there, uh, you know, sharing what we have because 
we are the experts in this field, and uh, we've got the information. And thanks to SAMHSA and other organizations, we've got so much that can help us out there. And uh, I think, you know, remembering that with our members, they're out there struggling in their community, and, uh, you know, sharing what we've got and, and remembering, you know, we all have the same bottom line. Yeah, um, I agree with both of them. Really just distributing the information and the resources and tools we have is a key component to the whole prevention effort. Great. So uh, a question that I'm often asked, and I am going to uh, use language from uh, the Communities Talk, uh, communities talk FAQ, FAQs, um, it is about how to use the SAMHSA grant to, uh, for events. The stipend is to provide, uh, the stipend is provided to help to defray the cost of planning and holding an event. Organizations may use the stipend to cover costs such as facilities rental, printing, promotion, or other expenditures as deemed appropriate by their organization. The organizations may not use the stipend to pay for food and beverages, entertainment, door prizes, discounts, incentives, giveaways, promotional products such as T-shirts, baseball caps, coffee mugs, or anything not specifically related to planning and conducting town hall meetings on, on underage drinking prevention. And again, if you um, want to see that language again, it is on the Communities Talk website under the Frequently Asked Questions. Now we'll follow up with a question for the group. How do you evaluate your Communities Talk events and how do you measure, um, well, how do you measure your success? For ours, we always have a survey um, that, you know, it, it, we do an evaluation at the end of it and we encourage our families and, and our, any of our participants there to complete that. And, you know, how we measure that, are we, some of the questions that we ask, you know, are, can we change behaviors? Uh, have they learned new information? Uh, is there a takeaway that people have that they can, you know, go home with or, or back into their community with? So that's really important to, to remember any time you do an event that you want to uh, always do some type of an evaluation. And one other way when we use the clickers, we're able to do part of that on the clickers and, and get a lot of good information there too uh, as we, uh, at the end of it, we can utilize that as another way to uh, evaluate our audience. Okay, follow-up. Um. Oh, hi, Ali here. Um, one way we evaluate our town halls um, is not only by physical attendance, but we also Facebook live stream. Um, and then we're able to look at those analytics later on and see who's viewed it, how many people have viewed it, and even how many people have shared it with other people. So that's a great way for us to um, also analyze how impactful our community town hall events were. How do partners participate in the evaluation? Hi, this is Sally. Um, for the, in the case of our town hall meeting, um, we asked people for feedback in the form of a survey at the end of the town hall meeting, what worked, what didn't work, what new ideas do they have, and then would they be interested in future coalition events. So that was a way of sort of gauging interest, although we didn't expect that we would recruit new members. We wanted to sort of um, get some information that could help inform some other working groups that were happening um, in the town and on the campus. So um, part of our, of our work was to make a really nice glossy report that then could be shared with other agencies and organizations to inform their work. So part of our evaluation was with them, you know, was this helpful and have you implemented any of these strategies? Another tool too that people can utilize is SurveyMonkeys because after the fact if you've got people's emails you can follow up with them. And also with your coalition doing any, some kind of a focus group, particularly with the youth, 
uh, that are involved because that'll really help to to get some good information from you know what what they felt worked and what didn't work, and what messages you know were taken away and and uh, if there was anything where you missed the mark. Allison, I'd like to start this question out with you and others if they um, have feedback. Uh, do any of the youth commissioners work directly with partners? Um, yeah, so all of our youth commissioners usually work directly um, with our partners, especially those within the prevention subcommittee. Um, so just the other week, actually, for an example, um, our entire prevention subcommittee met with the um, town planner of uh, Loomis, which is a town we're trying to pass a social host ordinance in. Um, and we're constantly working on collaborative projects directly, just the youth, with our other drug-free coalitions and with our educators and our faith-based organizations, whether it's um, putting on different educational events like the youth leadership retreat or even just attending different summits like going when we attended CADCA last year, um, it was me and one other youth commissioner going with different uh, people throughout our partnerships with our, um, throughout our community, all attending the SAMHSA and CADCA uh, convention to learn more on how to be better um, drug-free coalitions and work for funding. So yeah, we all directly work with our partnerships. Great. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I have one other question, but if you have a burning question, please put that in the chat pod and we will try to get to it. Uh, Sally, do you find that establishments that don't serve alcohol, like the cinema, to be more receptive to partnering? Uh, uh, that, that's a great question. I would say um, yes and no. I think even establishments that do serve alcohol have times when they're not, their alcohol sales are not the primary part of their business. Um, and they're interested in getting people into their businesses, into their restaurants. Um, so typically during the daytime or um, when students are away, for example, so that those places are largely empty in the evening, they may be more open. Um, but absolutely, places that, businesses that do not serve alcohol have a very vested interest in um, having entertainment and things available for people that aren't drinking or maybe are going drinking later. Um, so I think it goes both ways, yep. Great. Uh, this follow-up question, Sally, you uh, touched upon this, but the question I have is, do you have successful ways to stay engaged and remain in touch with your partners after a Communities Talk event has ended? Yeah, we, we do have uh, pretty successful ways to stay involved, in, in large part because the way we do our work is networking. Um, so for example, our town government leader um, is in touch with many of the community residents because they attend town hall meetings and things like that. The business owners are in touch with one another because they have their regular um, monthly meetings and things. Sometimes um, sending out um, email announcements or inviting people to events or featuring things in your social media um, can just help keep the communication flowing. But I think particularly if you're in a, um, you know, in a smaller town or region, you simply just bump into people, um, you know, whether it's at the grocery store or when you're hiking or you're watching your kid's soccer game or something. So sometimes you know, just having those relationships um, can keep you connected to one another and allow you to sort of pursue opportunities. Okay, so also I would like to urge our attendees to read our success stories because a lot of those success stories um, have questions that, about planning and hosting that can be useful to you as well um, so that you're not reinventing the wheel and, and hopefully you will have a few aha moments as you read through them. They're on um, the Communities Talk website. Um, so we have, uh, so thanks for all of those questions. Uh, they were quite thought provoking. Thanks to uh, our distinguished speakers. Uh, I hope you have already registered to host. 
a Communities Talk event uh, in 2019. If you have not, you can, re you can request registration information from info at stopalcoholabuse.net uh, to assist you, as we talked about before, to assist in the planning and hosting an event. SAMHSA is providing $750 stipends to the first 1,000 organizations to register, so please register soon. I hope that our time this afternoon has inspired fresh and actionable ideas for engaging partners in your next Communities Talk event. I invite you to visit the Communities Talk website at www.stopalcoholabuse.gov forward slash town hall meetings and join the underage drinking prevention conversation online by using hashtag communities talk and including the hashtag in your in your posts. Again, thank you for your time and being a part of this conversation. Have a great afternoon. And this does conclude today's conference call. Thank you all for your participation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>